Hello and welcome to Grinding Meaning. I am the expert layman, and it's been a while since we did one of these. It almost didn't happen. I thought that I had actually lost my streaming rights due to the copyright strike, and that it would just let me go through the motions and then just not stream it. But what really happened is, I had it on private and didn't notice. So, this is take two. Oh, let me, uh, technical stuff. Yeah, consciousness and the video feedback effect. There is actually a very strong connection between the two things, and there's actually science and stuff behind it. Um, when I was look, when I started, how do I roll this back? I create. I'm kind of surprised. Somebody, I should start over here. There was a a comment on one of my first uh, video feedback videos, like video feedback art. Like one of the first ones I made, somebody left a comment, really nice comment on it, which was kind of rough because uh, like I am so embarrassed by my old stuff. I just leave it up to shame myself into uh, <laughs> better, uh, putting out better stuff. Uh, but uh, it was it was really nice and I referenced and I said, you know, I've been meaning to do a video or at least, or I thought it said something else maybe, but you know, I've been meaning to cover like the video feedback effect and how I make it. And she was kind of curious of what hardware I use and things like that. Um, I thought I'd turn it into a story because this actually goes back quite a ways. Um, oh yes. I was going to queue for Warsong Gulch PVP. Um, I'm trying to get to friendly, which is like, ridiculously long and it takes so long to queue in we i could be on the stream an hour and still uh <laughs> and still not get into a match and then you get in the match and the whole other team is like full-on twinks and you have like two and then they won't let the game end all they want to do is just farm you so it can be fun yeah, it just takes a ridiculously long amount of time to get to rep up um but the story starts back in 1990, I know, or late 89, because that's that's when I got my driver's license. Yes, that old. But I uh, had a health class. And one of the things you could do uh, in lieu of like, I don't know, I think I need, needed it to pass or something. I forget. But uh, you could record a health video talking about, I don't know, it, it, Hardly anybody had video cameras, so like the standards were so low. If you just like did it, you, you know. But it was it was it was kind of fun to do. But while I had access to my neighbor's camera, I accidentally was panning around the room. Like you don't understand now that you can put yourself on your phone and everything. But like there was a time where seeing yourself on a TV was like one of the coolest things ever. Hard to imagine now, but at the time it was. But I was like panning the. The, t uh, the camera around the room looking at stuff and looking at what it looked like on the TV and it panned across the TV and there was like this little flare up of color and it just kind of like blew up and got bright and I aimed it back and it blew up and got bright and started playing around with it and turns out if you get it lined up differently it can create you know kind of like swirly patterns and uh, the thing about me um, I got I got the tism uh, overcome a lot of it but uh, I still get fixated on the uh it's funny. I, I can't remember somebody, I, I can't remember where this started, but a good description of my video art could be called geometry porn for autists. Because, Well, it is for me anyway. I don't want to speak for all. But when you see, it's kind of like, you know, watching a flame or watching oil on water or just the movement of water in general or geometric progression. Like we love that shit, or at least I do and those like me do. So as I saw the patterns pop up on the TV, I was pretty fixated. And remember, the this was like computer generated animation at the time looked pretty awful. I mean, I think Pixar was doing some like Toy Story stuff that looked pretty good, but that was about it. So seeing highly detailed, fluid motion, bright colors, contrast it was it was really freaking cool. And I fixated on it for a while. But you know, I was a teenager and girls existed, you know. <laughs> so I, I kind of forgot about it at some point about, uh, Oh, 94. 
uh, my VCR broke. And my neighbor said, well, you had a old video camera you could use it. You know, you'd sell me so I could use it, uh, use it as a VCR. And so the, the battery didn't hold a charge anymore and had been sitting in his closet for like a year. And this was like a, and this was almost the identical model that I'd used in high school. And I'm like, oh, cool. Played around with it a little bit. I don't know, got distracted again. And then we didn't, I didn't hardly party at all, but uh, had some people over, having a few drinks. Somebody, tell, some, somebody hands me a freaking mushroom. Not too bright, but uh, I'm not going to go into that whole thing. But essentially, I was profoundly creative for many, many hours after that. And one of the things I did was just create video feedback. Uh, videos like VHS tapes. I was, I, I did Pink Floyd and some other stuff. Oh, side note: years later, um, I found on somebody's shelf uh, a copy of one of my videos. Yes, I I went viral on VHS. Well, not really viral, but like I don't know, weird bragging, right? But uh, and that that was really cool. And then again, you know, it, it went away for a while, and then. 97, 98, um, I made, uh, I made a couple more and actually saved the tapes because I, I lost all the previous tapes or people borrowed them. They didn't come back, that kind of thing. So I, I just wanted a tape. Okay. Fast forward again to about 2000. Three, two thousand four. No, it'd probably be closer to two thousand five. Um, I'm currently thinking I'm going to make some money uh, transposing people's VHS tapes to uh, to DVD, but the it seems like it would be such a simple thing, but the hardware was terrible. It was tedious, and it was you weren't going to make money doing that. <laughs> but I was able to put that one tape onto a DVD. Okay, fast forward to about two years ago. I came across that DVD. And I said, oh yeah, that's so cool. And I looked at it. And, you know, in the interim, a thing called YouTube came into existence. And it's like, I wonder. I wonder if I could just make weird freaking animation music art crap for YouTube. So I didn't have access to a camera anymore. So I had to go on eBay and find, again, I found almost the identical model. Actually, it's missing a couple of features. I really wish I had manual iris control, but beyond that, it's a really, really good camera. It's one of them old ones, just like the first one I used, where it's not like, you're probably imagining the giant shoulder camera. It, it's not that. It was a three component. You had the actual camera part, which was almost as big as the big one you held on your shoulder, but not quite that big. And then it had this thick cord that went down to the VCR part. And this thing, the camera was probably like three, four pounds. The VCR part was the size of like two loaves of bread, and it weighed about 12 pounds. And the battery weighed like three. <laughs> and if you wanted to use that camera, you had to walk around with a bag that weighed like 15 pounds, and the battery wouldn't last all that long. But there was a third component, which was the tuner. So if you wanted to use that as a VCR, you uh, could. And I found one on eBay. Funny, funny, funny story. The person who was selling it tried tried to like, like scam their way out of selling it to me because they, I guess they didn't pay attention to the shipping versus what they were putting it up for. So what they did was is, they just stalled on every step as long as possible, hoping I would cancel the order. And like, um, like five minutes before midnight, when they would have had to put in proof of shipping, or or say that they had shipped it, they didn't actually, they weren't required to put in proof at that moment. Apparently, like she clicked the button, and then like when it was supposed to have been here by, it didn't, it didn't arrive. And I'm like, no, man, I want this camera. She, you don't know how bad I want this camera. There's no way I'm canceling this. This is the only one like it on. Uh, eBay. And then just as like the the day, because you're like counting down the days, you know, and eBay was actually pretty cool about this. And they're like, hey, if nothing happens by this day, this happens. If nothing happens by this day, this day, this day happens. This thing happens. And 
on the second or third of like them failing to do what they were supposed to, not eBay, but the other party, they, uh, they gave me my charge back. They sent that money right back to PayPal. And then that afternoon, the camera arrived and I was in a moral situation. Like, man, I do have something that like I didn't pay for, but I feel like it's somehow less unethical to scam a scammer. I don't know. Maybe it's just a rationalization, but, I didn't really have a good mechanism to send her money. The, the, the transaction was closed, you know, and screw it. I kept the camera. But anyway, I got the camera and it worked pretty good. Um, I had to use it on an LCD TV at first, which I wasn't particularly good at. And the throughput on that is much, much lower than what you can do with a CRT. And finding actual analog CRT TVs is difficult because you think like, Oh, it's a tube TV. It's an it's not a digital TV, but the tuners went digital like in the late '80s. You know, any any TV that would go to a blue screen instead of static, that would that was a a digital picture or digital digital image you were looking at, and uh, the digital uh, converter that are it that's in them is ge- was generally better for providing quality on low resolution uh, signals, but Overall, like the throughput is way lower than it would be with like, you know, an analog TV. So I did find an analog TV and it was not cheap and it was not cheap to ship and it worked really good. And I started making videos. But before I did that, I took that DVD and pulled some video off it. I've done some video editing at the time, had some done some of it. I was, had made like one or two Rocket League montages. And back when YouTube first started, I'd made a few anime music videos. But uh, yeah, not, not, nothing like this. So I found a song that kind of worked with it. And then I, that was my first, uh, you know, video feedback loop or, you know, video, video feedback effect based uh, video on YouTube. And that's got to be, got to be getting close to two years ago. Okay, how I do it. Oh my God, I'm just going to keep... How many times am I going to auto AFK before I get into this battleground? <laughs> um, it's what happens when you take a camera that's connected to a TV so that the TV is displaying whatever the camera sees in real time. And then if you point that camera at the TV, it's a bit like pointing a mirror at another mirror, except the effect... Uh, can continue um, indefinitely. And it's uh, a good analogy is if you get a microphone too close to the amp, it'll start causing feedback. But before it starts causing that feedback, it'll create, you know, like reverb and echo and all kinds of effects. And from what I understand it, playing around with the audio feedback effect is what gave birth to synthesizers. So you might almost look at what I'm doing as a video synthesizer. And there are video synthesizers, but they're completely electronic and internal, and uh, they're very limited in what they can do. The thing that makes the video feedback effect uh, takes it to another level is that part of that feedback loop exists in physical reality. It's not entirely, you know, in the computer. And part of the reason that, well, I think that it can create such unique effects is it's a, it's a self-observing system. And self-observing systems can hit some pretty amazing complexity. I also, and this is my personal thing, I haven't had access to a scientist that can address this, but my understanding is part of that loop exists in, you know, three-dimensional, our macro reality here, and part of it exists down, you know, at the subatomic level, at the quantum level. So it's, it's basically, the loop itself exists basically in two different realms. So when it's down, down there doing the, like the electron thing, <laughs> it, uh, I, I guess the point is since part of it 
exists in our reality, it seems to pick up a little bit of it. It makes things a, a little more fluid. They send, tend to form in the same ways that some, you know, a lot of the effects will almost look like like cells moving around. And it's it's not that it's alive. It's that the same, some of the same physical, like the same physical properties of the universe that make cells make sense. You know, hey, you got to have a boundary. So then if a boundary is around a point, it's going to be, you know, it's going to form a cell. So it's not, it's just more like just how things work in, you know, reality than, you know, I'm not creating life with the video feedback effect. <laughs> uh, but it is related to consciousness. Or at least uh, there's this really cool scientist that answered my email. And I, I emailed him because he had this really cool paper about, well, consciousness and the video feedback effect. And I'm going to try to do my best. I'm, 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 I didn't ask him if he, it was cool if I mentioned him, so I'm not going to. But uh, I said something like this to him, and he seemed to feel like we were on the same page, so I'm pretty confident. The premise of the paper is that the movement, you know, your, your brain consumes a lot of energy. There's a lot of stuff going on. It's, it's a big chunk of your, like, metabolic budget. And his, his, kind of his premise of the paper was that the movement of the en energies in your brain will cause a secondary architecture, almost like a, like a virtual reality, except not digital. And consciousness is something that exists within that secondary architecture. And uh, there's sim similarities in the architecture of a conscious feedback loop creating the experience of consciousness and the self-observing system that I use to create my video effects. And again, I'm not... It's really easy to start assuming, you know, a lot of woo here, but it's just like how my videos can produce things that look like cells or tentacles and stuff like that. It's just like there's a there's a logical fallacy called uh, post hoc ergo propter hoc, it means something like occurred afterward, therefore therefore caused by, and uh, it's just to assume like A happened, then B happened, so. B must have been caused by A, but the best rebuttal for that is, well, A and B could actually be caused by C that you didn't notice. And that's, I think, the case here where, like, st structures in reality, you know, there's certain rules to how things can interact. So there's things tend to manifest in particular ways, even in different systems. And I think this is just that. Like, whenever you have a self-observing system with enough information throughput, and part of that system exists at the... Uh, you know, quantum realm and part of it exists in the physical realm, um, you're going to create some cool stuff. Whether that be, you know, my, my silly art videos or consciousness, it seems to uh, seems to share a similar structure. Now, you could have a lot of fun with conspiracy theories on that, but uh, it's cool enough without it. Um, yeah, he actually had... This is how I found him. Um, I... Uh, I was looking for it, and I found the, I found the video first, and the video was actually um, what he used in the paper to uh, cite the example of uh, what do you call it? How it's an analog, you know, a similar structure to the brain. And I I saw the video, and I'm like, "This is lame. It's black and white. The frame rate isn't great. Man, who made this crap?" As I and as I read through the paper, and I, I get down to the references at the bottom. Like, oh shit, he made it. <laughs> Better not tell him. Well, I hope he's not listening to this. <laughs> uh, but I really enjoy it, and it's it's really really hard. Oh, hardware. What do I use? I have three different LCD TVs. I have. An LED LCD, which is the, the backlit by LEDs, but the picture is controlled by LCDs. And then I have a, a straight-up LED TV. And then uh, I actually have, and this is my favorite TV. 
You know what? I'll get to that one last. I, I, I'm going to, I have two, I actually have three CRTs, but one of them's digital and I just need to throw it away because I can't seem to do anything with it, but I'm lazy. But the other two is a 12 inch and then a 19 inch uh, CRTs, both full analog. And the throughput on the analog signal, like the crazy fast frame. It is weird because the analog TV is technically only like 240p and 30 frames per second, but it's about a hundred times the information throughput on a fully analog system because there's no digital conversion. It doesn't have to, you know, convert it back and forth between digital and analog. And even, uh, and I do have an all digital system, man, I'm not, I'm not staying on well. TVs, two analog TVs. As far as cameras, I have one old on your shoulder camera that just doesn't seem to be able to do a whole lot. But then I have the one I talked about before, and those are my two analog cameras. And then, at one point, I was uh, I only had the analog camera, and I would use it on my LCD TVs, and I could make cool stuff. And I'd use it on my analog TVs, and that was cool. Oh, my favorite TV is like one of the the first generation HD TVs, and the reason I love it is it's a damn near analog TV. For some reason, the converter that uh, converts the analog signal into the digital picture is like way higher quality than what they put in them today. <laughs> and I can actually like the, the else, the backlit first generation 720p LCD TV behaves more like the little tube CRT TVs than it does the other LCD TVs, which makes me think a lot of the limiting factor is, all the digital processing that, that that's done between because the, the big thing is latency and throughput. So that leads me to the digital camera. So I needed a digital camera with like zero or almost no latency. I needed to be able to get that signal to the TV. Like, cause even like, I don't know, like one, like, uh, uh I'm trying to figure out whether I want to express this in frames or like <laughs> a percentage of a second. But like, basically, if you got more than like 10 or 15 seconds of uh, lag in your in your loop, it, you're just not going to be able to create anything good. Um, so, ironically, I found what I needed on the cheap. Because it was really hard to find zero latency cameras because there's actually FCC rules like limiting that. You wouldn't think it, but like at one time, TV stations had a lot of power and in a way to like cut out competition, they made sure that consumer hardware couldn't like uh, broadcast live to a TV, which, which is weird because, you, you know, when video cameras first came out, like in the 80s, there was no such rules because like hardly anybody had cameras. But as more people started, started to have cameras, they want to to limit that. So actually trying to get a, a camera that will send to a TV in real time is surprisingly difficult. But luckily, a, a huge market of home surveillance emerged and they had the power to push through the regulations preventing the real-time broadcast. Because um, initially it was just for businesses, so that's where they drew the line. But then when, as soon as it became consumer, I, at any rate, I was able to get like a very low latency surveillance camera for like 40 bucks. I mean, the lens was about, was in like another 30 bucks, but still, that's pretty cheap. Oh my God. <laughs> Wasn't expecting this. I think I was another minute from AFKing out of the game. But uh, I really wanted a manual lens. So I have manual iris, manual focus, manual zoom. Um, it's really clunky and it's hard to move them smoothly. So I would like to get it like a, a much better lens at some point. Um, so those are my cameras. Those are my TVs, uh, software. Um, I use OBS, which is what I'm using right now to stream. And I have an old copy. Sorry, Mike is running away from me. I have an old copy of, sorry, I got to buff people. I'm trying not to be an asshole. We got six people. <laughs> Uh, an old copy of Premiere Elements. And that's all I use to edit my videos. 
And as far as image editing, I actually just use paint.net. And it, I'm not a masochist, but what I do understand is if you put limitations on your ability to do things, the, the strategies you generate to overcome those limitations ends up in better art. I think, I think it's basically like the George Lucas effect. Like when he had immense things to overcome, he became a god. And then as soon as, you know, hey, CG is here, it got a lot easier. Not so much. Although I think he has redeemed himself. Like I, I think just about everybody has a more positive disposition towards the prequels because of the recent movies. <laughs> But uh, yeah, and I've been making like I've been making two video, at least two videos a week for a year now, and at least one video a week, I think, for almost two years. And it's all about getting better. I always try to do something new and different in the video. That's why some of them are terrible. And then other videos, if I really like the song, I'm, I will not touch the song until I feel like I have an effect sequence that's worthy of it. Which is why, you know, it was like a year, year and a half before I even touched Pink Floyd or Led Zeppelin. And I'm like, I I have too much respect for the band to sully them with my poor skills. <laughs> uh. Now, personally, I think... Uh, as far as consciousness goes... I, I think... Oh, I almost said his name. <laughs> I think the... Uh, the academic doing the research on this um, is essentially right. I think that's why it's so hard to knock things down or lock things down in the brain. People are going to die because, <laughs> you know, maybe maybe it's not fair to people to be uh, streaming while PvPing, especially if you're healing. <laughs> but I've gotten through most of what I wanted to get through anyway. Um, I just love it. Oh, and when I'm, so I basically shoot a bunch of stuff, try to generate whatever kind of cool effects I can, and then I'll go through the video and try to pluck out sequences. The longer, the better. I love it when I have a sequence that I can, I don't have to do a whole lot to, and it kind of already matches up to the song. He must be upstairs. Yeah, I try to do as little to my videos as po to, to, to them as possible. I feel like the more I put my thumb into the pie, the worse it gets. As far as trying to make it fit to the music. Like, I actually don't, I typically don't choose the music till very late in the process. And the process is basically, uh, crop it out, clean it up, try to filter out the crap I don't want, which is mostly just the white. Um, cause it's almost like an architect talking about a, uh, talking about a sculpture in that, like all my videos are already there. Okay. Limited attention. Uh, hope you got a potion. Oh, I don't think he has a potion. <laughs> uh, oh, well, this is not going to go well. Get through the door. Get through the door. Get through the door. Just get me through the door. I feel like if I if I can take long enough to die, it's an, it's a victory in and of itself. Uh, I am not paying attention to this game, but I really oh yeah. And uh, usually it takes about I don't know twelve iterations, and most of the renders are fairly deep. Like I've gotten really good at extracting stuff out without losing the information, and that takes a lot of clock cycles. Like a typical video, if you count up all the time spent rendering to get that video done, 15, 20 hours. Uh, 
A lot of times I have to speed things up or oftentimes I have to slow them down a bunch. And to slow them down without it looking choppy is, uh, it, it, it takes a few steps. And the thing is, you know, of my uh, neurological issues, you could say, one of them is being neurotic. Like I, you know, I have a, and I take issue with the, with the, I don't know, psychology definition of neurotic because they call it a tendency towards uh, negative thoughts and, you know, negative feelings. And I think neurotic people just need to, sp they just have a, they, their brain needs something to chew on. They're like a shark and they got to keep swimming. So you're not going to, The answer isn't, doesn't, at least for me, doesn't seem to be trying to find a way to slow yourself down. It seems to be like, put that shit to work, monetize it, you know, <laughs> doing crazy amount of tedious stuff. Um, for a purpose is, uh, okay, how is he shooting through the floor? How is he not? I I am just an embarrassment right now. <laughs> I'm playing this so poorly. I keep forgetting that I'm healing. I'm like, oh yeah, DPS. Yeah, I think I'm gonna focus on this for now. I think, I, like I said, I think I got through everything I wanted to get through. There, there is a great deal more to it. Like, I don't know. Like, I'm afraid I'm going to give people seizures, so I put the Simpsons intensity warning in front of it. Uh, you know, I realize this is really bad streaming right now because the gaming is boring, except what it isn't. Oh, I oh know. So when it is and I start talking, but when it, it does start getting exciting, I can't, I don't have enough freaking brain power left to keep. Oh, they cut through that bubble fast. This is just silly. Um, I think I'm going to call the stream. It's going to be a relatively short one, but I ho hopefully I, I answered the stuff that person was, uh, curious about so yeah just just I guess, I guess i should be very clear my my animations are not computer generated they're created through a very strange process and the thing is i have so much trouble explaining to people that it's not computer generated like the the reaction i get when i try to tell someone my videos not computer generated the best analogy I've seen is in office space where he doesn't get the proper cover letter on his, on his TPS report or whatever it was. And he's already been told by a couple people, he's read the memo and one more boss comes up. And he's like, Hey, we got to talk about your, uh, your cover letters or whatever. And he's like, oh, you know what? I, I caught, I, I screwed that up. I didn't, I didn't catch the memo. I've read the memo now. I know the policy. It won't happen again. Steve and uh, Sharon have already come and talked to me about this to make sure we're all on the same page. So we're all good. And the guy like stares at him blankly and says, so yeah, we're using new cover letters. Like, like everything the guy just said didn't happen. And he just moves on as if just nothing but babble had come out of his mouth. That's what I feel like when I try to tell people my animations aren't computer generated. They're just like, it's like they, they throw a divide by zero error. So maybe I can cut this up later and give some visual examples of stuff. But yeah, I think I'm going to call the stream here. Uh, I think uh, 
Thank you all for watching, and I will see you later.